Hello, good morning. Um, we're going to be talking about remote islands as part of the Caribbean Island Ecology course this morning. This is one of the long delayed lectures which I'm getting back to you online and hopefully it will remind you of some of the things that we spoke about originally in the lectures. We're going to be talking about remote islands because they are very interesting and they very much take a lot of these biological processes um, to the extreme which um, the uh, processes which um, happen on uh, Caribbean islands. There aren't many remote islands uh, in the Caribbean so we have to go outside the Caribbean to see some of the best examples like Tristan da Cunha here which is down here in the South Atlantic midway between Africa and South America. It's on the mid-ocean ridge there. It's a volcano which is poked up from the, um, the sea ocean floor and uh, risen above sea level. And so it's a, quite a small island, the peak of a volcano, um, and it's surrounded by thousands and thousands of miles of ocean. Um, as I said, there's not many of these type of islands. No. There aren't any of these type of islands in the Caribbean, but we're going to be talking about uh, these remote islands, uh, mainly in terms of extinction this morning. We want to um, see how extinction varies when you have a small island which is isolated from the continent. So we're going to be talking about important processes in the formation of remote island biota and the main focus of the lecture on extinctions. Extinctions on remote islands. Extinctions and how inherent biological factors of the organisms on remote islands if affect those extinctions. And finally, we'll take a look at extinction and external factors. We will be considering important processes in the formation of remote island biota only so far as to set a context. We'll be talking more in more detail on important processes in formation of remote island biota in other lectures. So what are remote islands? As I said before, they are islands which are stuck off in the middle of the ocean, very much remote from continental areas. Uh, some examples are Tristan da Cunha and Ascension Islands, which are those mid-ocean uh, ridge volcanic islands that I showed you on that title slide. Uh, Eastern I Easter Island, Fiji, Pitcairn, Hawaii and Galapagos, all of those are in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Hawaii in the Central Pacific, Galapagos, Easter Island in the Eastern Pacific, and Fiji and Pitcairn in the South Pacific. But they're all characterized by being small, remote, and a long way from the nearest continent. They were probably never joined on to any sort of continent in the past. So they're true remote oceanic islands. Uh, we have a couple of other remote islands as well, which are bigger, New Zealand and Madagascar. So these guys, were, these guys are much larger. New Zealand uh, is also derived from volcanic activity on the edge of a plate, and it probably never was joined onto a continent, so all the plants and animals had to disperse in there. Madagascar, on the other hand, uh, was part of the Gondwanan landmass and most recently part of the African continent um, and before it split off. But it's been isolated and remote, surrounded by ocean for many, many millions of years. So it acts like an oceanic remote island, even though it does have its origins as a continental island. Okay. But it's more of these smaller islands which are most appropriate for what we're talking about. So what's so important about these remote islands? Well, the first thing that we need to look at is immigration. And what's important and what's different about these remote islands is that uh, the immigration is very much restricted. You will only get species reaching these remote islands which can disperse across uh, many thousands of kilometers of open ocean. So that means that very few individuals of new species 
reach these remote islands. So the biota of these remote islands is derived from these few individuals. Um, these individuals necessarily have to have very efficient dispersal mechanisms. So they have to be able to cross these many thousands of kilometers of ocean. So they have to be able to disperse very well. So the types of dispersal mechanisms that we're talking about, uh, usually by flying, uh, by wind uh, for the um, terrestrial species, but you also get species which are dispersed by the ocean currents. They float in the ocean but they tend to be more restricted to the coastal areas of these remote islands. They don't usually get further inland. And it's the terrestrial species which are dispersed by wind and by hitching a ride by animals, which are the ones which colonize the interior of the islands. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a later uh, lecture. So remote, remote island species are essentially derived from a subset of continental species that disperse well. And these are often of the R-selected type. So these are species which focus on uh, reproduction before survival, before competition. And as part of that, they need to reproduce very quickly um, and disperse widely so they can find niches where competition is absent so they can survive in those niches okay so they're often r selected species because it's r selected species which are able to disperse the best so these uh, successful colonists tend to be generalists as well as most r selected species are they are generalists um, we have two main different types of vegetation communities, the sea strand vegetation and the interior island uh, vegetation. The sea strand vegetation is usually derived from uh, plants and animals which disperse um, by being carried by ocean currents, the, the drift seeds that we saw in our drift seed practical. As you can see there, um, Examples are the coconut, uh, the crapo seed there. Uh, we can see some more manicaria palm, the cricket ball ones, and other different types of seeds, which can disperse widely. But they tend only to establish colonies on the edges of the island because they, it's not in their best interest to colonize inland because their primary means of dispersal is in fact on the, the oceans. So if they go too far inland, their propagules aren't going to reach the ocean. So they don't like to go very far inland. Okay. Animal dispersed um, propagules are the ones which tend to colonize the interior of the islands. And we'll talk more about that in a later lecture. Uh, once these species arrive, they speciate. Well, they either speciate or they go extinct. Some species does occur. Uh, speciation does occur mainly due to the isolation of these immigrants. When the immigrants arrive on this remote island, they are isolated from their previous um, their previous uh, population. So they begin to uh, specialize in ways which allow them to survive better on the island. And if this island has many empty niches, you are going to get a lot of adapted radiation as the single species uh, specializes in many different niches and there in so doing forms many different uh, species. Okay, so the spe each um, group of that original species would separate off and uh, colonize a different niche and in so doing uh, they become isolated themselves and they form new species with new characteristics to uh, take full advantage of those species. Okay, Most of these remote islands are fairly small, like you saw a picture of um, uh, Ascension Island there, or Tristan da Cunha, sorry. Um, it's fairly small, so you don't have very large habitats 
not many different habitats either. So you would tend to have room for few species. Okay, And an important factor is that small islands mean that you tend to have few individuals of each of those different species. So we get on to the main uh, the main rationale behind this lecture and that is talking about extinctions. On these remote islands uh, extinctions are caused by populations um, all the individuals of these populations uh, being eliminated and therefore that population cannot go forward because there's no individuals left to reproduce so you get a complete loss of that species and it becomes extinct. On these remote islands extinction rates are not supposed to be any different compared to an equivalent area on the mainland. However they may be different due to ecological differences in the plants and the animals colonizing the, these remote islands. So in other words the animals which um, plants and animals which colonize these remote islands have to be our selected species, they have to be generalists, and they have to be able to disperse a long way. Okay, So it could mean that these uh, plants and animals have inherent biological um, uh, properties which make them more predisposed to extinction. Okay. Due to it, also due to the remoteness of these remote islands, extinction can mean that niches are vacant for a very long time. So on the mainland, if a species goes extinct, it quite often its niche doesn't remain vacant for very long. Before long, um, either more individuals of that same species come in and colonize and replace the species which become ext became extinct, or other species discover these, uh, these resources which nobody is using and they move in to utilize these resources and in so doing fill the niche. Okay? On remote islands we have to wait until another species is able to disperse across these long distances, a, pro a process which can take many, many years and take a very long time so these niches can remain vague for a very long time. So extinction on remote islands. It is in fact more prominent than on the continents. Um, and here's some stats to uh, give you an idea how extinction on remote islands is very problematic. 90% of all bird extinctions in the last 2000 years or so or in the historical record have been on oceanic or remote islands. 75% of mammal extinctions again on remote islands. Quite often it's associated with human arrival. So not only Europeans but also Polynesians, also um, Indonesians, uh, also um, uh, Europeans of course. When humans arrive on an island it's quite often followed by a, a wave of extinction of all the remote island biota. So why are these remote island species more vulnerable? And we've just got some pictures here of the different um, species which can go extinct. So we have the dodo, that's the, um, the classic remote island species which goes extinct. This, island, this um, insect is the, the Lord Howe Island stick insect and it's actually quite big. It gets about so big. So it's an example of gigantism on uh, remote islands which we'll talk about in another lecture. And we also have a tortoise here, a Galapagos tortoise which also uh, has gone extinct on a couple of the islands of the Galapagos. And um, plants are not immune to this type of extinction. We have a type of Asteraceae. Um, I believe this one is on Ascension Island and it has gone extinct. Okay, So why are these remote species more vulnerable to extinction? Well there are two main reasons. Inherent biological reasons and uh, external factors. 
Right. So but the first and the main reason why extinctions occur on remote islands more, more frequently than on continental islands is because these islands are small. Okay? The smallest of these islands means that there <coughs> is only ever going to be a small range uh, for the endemic species which result on these islands from isolation. A small range means small populations of these species. So you're only going to ever get a small number of these endemic remote island species. Okay? And small populations make these species very vulnerable to extinction. Okay? Whenever you've got small numbers of species, small numbers of individuals in a species, a event can come through and wipe out that population. And when there is no other, uh, other populations around, then that species then becomes extinct. Okay? So I've got here um, Tristan de Kooner Island again, and this is a particular habitat called the Fern Breaks. Okay, let me write that down. Fern Breaks which occur on um, Tristan de Kooner Island. But they only occur at a particular altitude of the island where you get uh, mist and cloud, which enable these species, these species of ferns to survive. And that's at the mid elevations of this fairly steep volcanic island. So this darker area, this darker band around the island. When you go down to the lower altitudes, it gets much drier. And when you go to the higher altitudes, it's also drier because the peak of the mountain sticks up above the clouds. And it's only around the middle elevations that you get these fern breaks. Okay? And as you can imagine, in the global scheme of things, this is a very small area. So the plants and animals which specialize in this type of uh, ecosystem have a very small range. Okay? So it would only take one hurricane blowing across this island which would open up the canopy. Okay? It may not kill off all the plants in this ecosystem but it may just wipe out the uh, animals in this ecosystem. Or a fire could go through and burn out this entire ecosystem and, and one fell stroke all the plants and animals in that particular ecosystem are pushed into extinction. Okay? So, where do humans come into this? Um, okay, let, let's, let's leave humans out of it for a while. So, these low population numbers mean that these uh, remote island ex um, species are more prone to extinction. Some of these species are more prone to extinction than others. Uh, the species which are more prone to extinction tend to be the specialists, okay? And the ones which are least vulnerable to extinction tend to be the generalists. Specialists tend to be concentrate on one particular niche, okay? So they really reduce the size of the areas in which they can survive to a very small area. So they only have small numbers. Quite often the specialists um, evolve a large body size or a carnivorous diet to be able to survive in that particular area. And an example of that is these large elephant birds which you got on Madagascar and New Zealand. Uh, they form large size so they can take advantage and uh, compete best in their niches. But unfortunately, it means a large size means that you need a large area to hold a large enough population for these animals to survive. Generalists, on the other hand, tend to be able to survive anywhere in the island. So they don't restrict themselves to a particular habitat. Generalists are quite often very small as well, so they can survive in greater numbers. So that means that they tend to be least vulnerable to extinction. Okay? So it's the large carnivores which are most vulnerable to extinction and the small generalist herbivores or nectivores 
um, which are the least vulnerable to extinction. Here we have the elephant bird on Madagascar and uh, New Zealand, both of which are extinct. And here we have one of the small honey creepers in Hawaii, which is still around today, although in pretty low numbers. So humans can exacerbate these problems which are inherent in remote island species by changing the environment, by causing uh, or increasing the incident of events which can wipe out a small population. Okay, probably the biggest um, factor which uh, humans uh, pursue to reduce the numbers of these rare island endemics is by changing the habitats. And here we have a picture of um, Barbados. Barbados, the habitat has almost been completely changed from the original tropical rainforest into a or tropical rainforest, tropical dry forest into sugarcane plantations. And it's only small remnants of the original uh, habitat which occur in a couple of the gullies in Barbados. Very little natural ecosystem left. So you can imagine that any endemic species which used to occur on Barbados have all been pretty much wiped out. It was a pretty small island to begin with and the 90%, 95% of that small area has been completely wiped out anyway. Okay, so that leaves very little area for these endemic species to survive in. Um, humans will quite often specialize in the high productivity environments on these remote islands. So here in Hawaii, large areas of the flat, low-lying, high productivity rainforests have been cleared for planting pineapple. Okay, um, humans preferentially um, clear these large productiv high productivity uh, habitats because they are usually the best for agriculture. Quite often these habitats are alongside rivers so they retain moisture throughout the year and so their growing season can continue throughout the year. It's either um, uh, alongside rivers or in river flats and that sort of thing. So quite often these areas are preferentially cleared for agriculture. So the specialists in these high productivity habitats are quite often the ones which are most vulnerable to extinction. Other external factors which um, make island species more vulnerable to extinctions are invasive exotics. Okay, so we can have introduced plants and animals which can outcompete or predate the native island species. Okay, remote islands are particularly vulnerable to these things because they tend to evolve in isolation and therefore they are naive to many of the uh, competition tricks or the predation tricks which um, continental populations have had to get used to and evolve to cope with over time. Okay, the island species have not been exposed to the, you know, it's, it's almost like a, uh, an arms race which has moved on after these island species have moved out and they can no longer uh, compete with the continental species. So we get organisms like the mongoose, which when they are introduced to uh, these remote islands, particularly in the tropics, they will um, be able to predate all the native island species. Quite often these native island species have evolved things like flightlessness. They can no longer fly because to fly uh, makes them more vulnerable to being swept out to sea. So, and there's no real reason for them to fly because there weren't any predators on the island. But the mongoose is now introduced and it is able to wipe out these flightless species which have no defenses against this ground-based predator. Okay. Another example is the cherry guava, which is a big problem up in uh, Jamaica, which is 
uh, more or less an oceanic island. Plant species cannot uh, compete against the cherry guava which is able to utilize very thin, very degraded soil with low nutrients and it's, be, it's evolved to be able to uh, exploit these types of soils very efficiently, more efficiently than the native endemic species of plants on places like Jamaica and other remote islands. So the cherry guava, when it gets in there, it can form thickets which uh, none of the native species, none of the native endemic species of island, island species can um, uh, compete against so the um, island species will go extinct so that's extinction from external factors so in summary then with this lecture we've seen that um, our remote island species have particular properties based on the filter that they have to pass through to get to the island and once they're there they have to struggle through uh, different pressures and one of the main problems with these island species is that they have to exist in very small populations. They have to live in very small populations because there isn't very much habitat there and this makes them naturally very vulnerable to extinction and because of this the vast majority of recorded ex extinctions around the world, over 90% when it comes to things like birds and over 70% when it comes to animal, uh, mammals, are uh, um, mammals and birds which you find on remote islands. Okay, so those extinctions are reasons uh, caused because of inherent biological factors but also because of external factors and humans play a big role in that by changing the environment, by causing more disturbances and by doing things like introducing exotic plants and animals which can outcompete the uh, native endemics. Okay, so there you go. That was uh, a little lecture on extinction on remote islands. Hope you um, learned something about that. Okay then, thank you very much. <laughs>